your friend and mine, the White Mamba, Brian Scalabrini, joins us here on the program. Scal, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you guys? I'm doing great. I hope you had a nice, uh, nice trip down to Charlotte with all the all the good eating down there. It looked like you guys were having a good time. Um, and now you're back for uh, probably one of the bigger games of the year, Golden State Warriors tomorrow night. Obviously, there's uh, going to be a lot of eyes on this one. Um, how are these Celtics who have been playing so well lately uh, looking at this game? I'm sure it's one they've had circled for a very long time. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, it's anytime a team knocks you out of the playoffs, it's a rival. They, you know, beating the Celtics on their home court in the NBA Finals, obviously there's a bad taste in your mouth. And the Celtics also got to make sure that they have an avenge loss, you know, to, to the um, regular season game with, where you know the Boston Celtics having a much better season than the Golden State Warriors. But on that one day, um, whenever it was, when they went to Golden State, like, Golden State manhandled the Celtics. They were physical. They moved the ball. The Celtics were just running in mud. So, yeah, I'm sure that this is a big day, and I'm sure the crowd will be ready to go, and it'll be an exciting night. We saw reports from practice uh, today that Jalen Brown did practice. He spoke with the media after. Do you think he'll be available tomorrow night? I hope so. You know, I I always like when you're playing with the big games and and, – that, you know, like that you could have, you know, your best foot out there. I don't know if he'll be available, you know, like those type of things. Like nowadays in, in the NBA, people don't want to risk it anymore. They don't want to re-aggravate the injury and miss another three weeks or anything like that. So, um, I mean, I hope he plays, but, you know, they'll make that decision once, you know, he goes to a, a, a shoot around and a, and a warm-up and determine if he's ready to go. Scal, the Warriors this year are really good at home and really, really bad on the road. Are you surprised to see that from such a veteran team that's accomplished so much? Well, you know what? They're not a veteran team because they're relying on younger players. Yeah, uh, you're you're right. Like, But if you look at, I think, um, and this was a week ago, you know how these stats, they move around. I think at one point, they're starting five with Steph, Clay, Draymond, Wiggins, and Kavon Looney. They were the best starting five in the NBA and I, as far as net rating. But that could have dropped off because they, they have struggled a little bit more, like losing some home games since Steph came back and Wiggins. But um, their, their bench just doesn't give them anything. And I think like you, that team in particular, you know, uh, last year you had Gary Payton the second, kind of an older guy, Otto Porter, Bielitsa, Iguodala, like they just had like like guys who knew how to play basketball and guys who could play off of what they currently do. This year, they have younger guys. And and I don't care like what type of coaching you had. If you're a young, up-and-coming, talented player, most of the time you have the ball in your hand, and now all of a sudden you go to the Golden State Warriors and you got to figure out how to play off the ball. And, you know, Jordan Poole is, is kind of a guy that that's kind of stands out, but he's really inconsistent. Like there will be nights where – so have six, seven turnovers in a, in a night. Have you know shoot eighteen shots and only get you twenty one points. So they they were just expecting more from those guys. But I don't, I can't. If you look at the Western Conference, I just can't quit the Warriors as saying they're not a championship caliber team. When you watch them, when they're at their best, when they're motivated, they could beat anybody. So I I know that they're looking at it the regular season and they're just trying to navigate it. And I'm sure they'll kind of trend upwards. But as of right now. Their, their struggles on the road to me were I think they were expecting like the younger up-and-coming players to do more, and they're just not getting that night in and night out. We're talking to Brian Scalabrini. Uh, Scal, how would you predict the rest of the season goes for Peyton Pritchard? Do you think he'll remain a Celtic? And if not, what are the Celtics looking for in terms of uh, return for trade for him outward? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question from the standpoint of – Peyton has been good when any of the Derek White, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Malcolm Brogdon, Marcus Smart, any of those guys are out. He gets the opportunity to play, and he has filled that role. I, I know how hard Peyton works, and he has success. He probably wants more of that. So when you say, like, looking for a return, it wouldn't shock me as we get closer to the trade deadline if the Celtics say, you know what, we're just going to try to do right by Peyton Pritchard maybe get a little bit more size, like maybe a stretch four type of guy and to come in. But remember, you still have to navigate, you know, the, the regular season. And I don't, I put Peyton Pritchard in the category of if a few things happen, he could be called on in an NBA playoff game and he could deliver in an NBA playoff game. So it'll be an interesting thing to see 
if they sort of do right by him and give him opportunity to play at a different place, or if they just tell him like, listen, we drafted you, you're in the contract. We never know what's going to happen, but we just, we just really trust that whatever you can bring to the table, if something were to go wrong, an injury or any type of thing that could happen throughout a playoff run, we, we want, we want you to be there. So I'm I'm kind of curious on how it plays out as well. You said do right by him. Does that do you have any indication that Pritchard is not happy in his current role with the Celtics? Well, I mean, yeah, and, and the indication would just be knowing the NBA and where he's been and and um, you know what he wants out of out of this league. I mean, I'm sure as happy as Peyton Pritchard is being on the Boston Celtics and all that stuff, every young player wants to play. And right now, right about this point contract extensions and all that other stuff come into play. So maybe he hasn't demanded a trade or maybe, um, maybe he's happy here in Boston. I would just assume that a young player as accomplished as him, the first, his first two years that he would want more. Scal, what would you say about uh, Joe Mazzulla's performance lately? Um, clearly the team's playing well. Are they responding to him? Yeah, I think, I think Joe's doing a great job. And I think the guys are settling into his coaching style. I think, you know, early on, there was this, like, huge controversy about timeouts and stuff like that. Right. I think he has, I think he has a, uh, like, this is just my personal opinion. I think he has a much better feel on when his team doesn't have, like, the energy. Yeah, I think the Charlotte game is a good example of that. He banged quick, two quick timeouts in the second quarter. After the second timeout, that was when Rob Williams came in. His energy was up. Everybody's energy was up from 540 uh, left to go in the half. They uh, went on a 36 to 14 run from that point. So I think he's getting like a better feel for that. Uh, but it's just like anything. Like he's, I know in, what he wanted to do early, he wanted to force other coaches to call timeout. So it, it, it makes him lose them. But no, I think, uh, I think the guys have responded to him. And it, just like anything, he's getting more experience. And I think he's thriving in this role. Uh, in that same, I guess, lane of thought, uh, something that Jason Tatum said after a game a couple days ago stuck with me. He was talking about uh, some of his fingers being banged up and taped and that that was something that he and Brad might fight about if he had to miss time for that. How much of a hand does Brad Stevens have in the day-to-day decisions with the team at this point with Joe Missoula being the interim coach still? I, I think you – I think – um I think you think that coaches decide who plays and who doesn't play from a from a load management standpoint. I think mm-hmm. that's above. I even think that's above, uh, like even the coaches. Like I think that might even be above Brad. To be honest with you, like it's. It, I'm sure it's a collaboration, but there's like ten sports scientists that are on our bus, and I hope I'm just getting to know all their names. I've been here for like you know ten years, so it's like they're all in the in the business of making sure they get the most out of the players. And so when you talk about an injury and stuff like that, is there rest days like kind of built in there? I mean, Tatum's going for an MVP, so I think it's a little bit different for him. He might have to push it a little bit more. It's just the way it goes. But, uh, yeah, and I, Joe Mazzula is not making probably decision on whether Tatum takes a load management day or not. You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. probably Brad Stevens, the sports science department, and probably even there's another uh, – you know, checks and balances before that that I don't even know about. So there's like 15 people deciding about Jason Tatum's fingers. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I don't, and I hope they're all on the same page. No, I don't know if it's, I don't know, if, like, but there's a lot that goes into it. Like if you, your fingers bothering you and your body is, you know, like a little bit run down and you can, they, they have these checks and, and these checks and markers, like what's your resting heart rate? What's your elevated heart rate? What's your, like all these things, they, and these kids go to school for this. They they can determine maybe if a player it would be beneficial for a player, and probably against a certain opponent to take a night off. So I I, I think it's more than just Joe Mazzula chewing the gum deciding. Ah, I think Tatum should take today off. Gotcha. Sound, that sounds miserable, honestly, for Joe Mazzula, doesn't it? You got fifteen guys <laughs> no. all telling you who to play and when to play him. That would piss me no, off if no, I was a coach. No, 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 no. It's like like have you guys noticed? If you got to like see the Rob Williams thing. On um, certain nights, it'll be 18, 19. Then you'll see a 27. Right. Then mm-hmm. he'll drop that down to 21. So he just gets like, I'm sure he gets a card that says, if you do this today, then tomorrow you're going to do that. So you got to kind of decide. Because I, I swear to you, in that Monday game, 
against Charlotte, he he sat Rob for a big stretch to keep his minutes down. So he, I would like, I'm just, I don't know the information, but I'll just guess 28, 27, 28 minutes against Golden State. Then whatever the following game is, I think it's Toronto. Watch him dial back down to 27. Joe Mazzula wants to play Rob Williams 48 minutes a night. He's that good, but it's just a man. That's like, that's how you manage injuries and that's where you see a Luke Cornett come in four minutes into the game because he's like today Rob can't play a ton of minutes so that's managing the Rob Williams and I would actually say it's probably better knowing in advance and having like a little bit of a guideline versus uh, you know like kind of gauging that on the fly all right we'll leave it right there then Brian Scalabrini thanks so much for the time we'll talk to you soon